Hey, we're in a series that I actually started five weeks ago, and this is the reason we've been doing the superhero jokes. I'm calling it Damascus to Rome, the superhero of Paul. And what we've been doing is looking at the life of Paul. We said up front, and it's so true, he was a bold man. He was a passionate man. He was, he was set on doing what he thought was the right thing to do. And for a lot of his years, he was a lost man, but he was certainly passionate about what he believed. We said that that Paul kind of was behind Jesus in age, somewhere between 4 and 14 years after Jesus was born, Paul was born. Paul had his Damascus Road experience when he was between 30 and 35 years old, and, and then he had 30 years of ministry before he died. Now, if he were alive today because of what he did, we said he would be considered a terrorist because he killed people that didn't believe the same way that he believed. But he's also probably single-handedly the most important person in terms of uh, the furthering of Christianity in the world ever, this side of Jesus. He wrote 13, possibly 14 books of the New Testament, depending on whether you believe he wrote the book of Hebrews, which I do. And... um, He's just an amazing guy. We started this series four weeks ago by talking about his childhood and how his childhood and his upbringing, the family he was born into and his education shaped his life and created the zeal that he had to persecute people who were following Jesus. Three weeks ago, we talked about his transformation process that began on the road to Damascus and carried over. Paul did some things that God really didn't want him to do up front because he was so zealous now about Jesus. He went out and started preaching Jesus in Jerusalem, and God didn't want him to do that. God wanted him to preach to the Gentiles, and but because he went ahead of God, he almost got killed twice in about two days because people didn't want to hear what he had to say. In fact, we told you they had to sneak him out of Jerusalem in a basket, and he ended up in the, in the, the Sinai Peninsula, out literally in the desert, and he spent Depending on on who you read, he spent somewhere between three and ten years in the desert. During that time, God spoke to him directly. During that time, God shaped him into who he would be as the Apostle Paul. And we said a couple weeks ago that he started doing what God called him to do. He and Barnabas hooked up, and Barnabas was like his mentor and his guide, and they started going and traveling, and they started sharing the gospel, but because because Paul was such a choleric personality, he got into conflict with a young man by the name of John Mark, because John Mark didn't want to stay and wanted to go home, and, and it created division, and then last week, we talked about the fact that Paul suffered throughout his whole life. And we can kind of relate to that because all of us suffer at one time or another, and he did. But we realized that God used his suffering to, to further the kingdom. And so here we are this week getting ready to look at something that I think is real important. But before we do, how many of you brought your Bibles? If you brought your Bibles, raise them up. Let me see them. Old school, new school, awesome. If you've got your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop with you for that matter, if you will go to the Version app. Click on the menu, scroll down, click on events, a map's going to pop up, click on Thrive Church, hit save, and all of my notes for this morning's sermon will be right there on your smartphone or your device. There are moments in history that change everyone. There are moments in history that alter the shape of our lives, and that's been true throughout history. But just take the last hundred years, for example. I mean, so much has happened in the last hundred years. Beginning with the Wright brothers on the Outer Banks and manned flight, an airplane. And not too many years after that, the world goes together in war, World War I. And before the end of that war, they're using airplanes to fight the war. And then after the war, the United States at least finds itself in the greatest depression they've ever seen. People committing suicide because of losing their savings. And and it was just a horrible time. And for my parents and my grandparents who went through that, it changed their lives completely. You know, my dad, I joke, my dad was a hoarder. 
I mean, he saved everything. He wouldn't throw anything away. And I guarantee you that's because he was a child in the Depression. And he saw what happened. And he saw how people lost everything. It shaped his whole life. And we get through the Depression. And lo and behold, the country's in another war. Another war. Another world war. It was unbelievable that another country would try to attack the United States, but they did. And thousands of people were killed, and it shaped our lives. A lot of us are here because of World War II, because of after World War II, the baby boom. And I'm a boomer, and a lot of us here are boomers, and that's all because our parents were separated and gone for a while and came back and well, yeah, you know what happens then. But anyway, it shaped our lives. It changed the way we think about things. And then I move ahead and think about the biggest thing I remember, the earliest thing I remember that was earth-shattering and earth-changing was the assassination of John Kennedy. Most people can remember where they were. I was in the third grade, and I remember all the teachers whispering and talking, but nobody would tell us what was going on. And that I, I just remember that so vividly. And then the civil rights movement. It changed everything. People were marching. People were getting killed for what they believed about civil rights. And then Martin Luther King stands on the mall in Washington, D.C. and gives his I have a dream speech. It changed thousands of people's lives. We still talk about it today. I remember Vietnam. I, I didn't go to Vietnam. I was lucky. In fact, my the year I turned 18 was the year the draft ended. But I have friends of mine that were killed in Vietnam. They were, they were upperclassmen from me. I remember that. I remember them coming home, and I remember the way the, the United States treated those people. They didn't get the homecoming the folks did in World War II or World War I. It changed our whole lives. John F. Kennedy wanted to put a man on the wound before the end, before the end of the, the decade. He didn't get to see that dream happen. But in 1969, in July of 1969, Neil Armstrong stepped on the face of the moon and he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then we saw the space, the space exploration just blow up. I mean, Literally, with Challenger. It shaped our lives. It changed the way we thought about things. And then for a while, everything was okay. And then in 2001, on my birthday, planes hit the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And it changed everything again. How many of you have been through an airport since 9-11? You're lucky if you can get on a plane without getting strip searched. And I'm, I'm serious. It changed everything. It changed everything. But then things got okay. And then lo and behold, our political system went crazy over the last six years. It went crazy. It polarized families and friends. And if you didn't think the way somebody else did, oh, man, you got beat up on, on social media. And it changed everything. And then COVID hit. Talk about changing things. The things I've just described have occurred in just the last hundred years. And it has changed who you and I are. It has changed the way we live. It has changed the way we go places. It has changed the way we do things in just a hundred years. There was a time in the Bible where an event like that occurred. But it just didn't change things for a week or two or a month or two or a year or two. The events I'm going to talk about this morning changed the way you and I act in church. It changed what you and I believe as believers. It really did. And I'm talking about something called the Council of Jerusalem. Now, most believers, maybe you've heard of it. But if I ask you to tell me what happened and what were the ramifications of that meeting, you couldn't tell me. But it changed the way you are today. 
And guess what? Paul was right smack dab in the middle of it. In fact, Paul's the one that caused it pretty much. And so we're going to look at that this morning. It changed the course of history for the church. You see, a lot of folks came to Jesus in the early days. But the early church grew almost exclusively with Jewish people. If you think about it, that's the people that were coming to Jesus. They were Jewish. They were learning and agreeing and believing that Jesus was their Messiah. He was the Messiah. Well, well, well. Lo and behold, the church sends Barnabas and Paul on missionary journeys. Go tell people about Jesus. But they didn't think of the ramifications of Paul and Barnabas going to tell people about Jesus because Paul and Barnabas were going to tell people about Jesus who weren't Jews. And that changed everything. I mean, for the first 10 years or so, it was cool. You know, we, we read about the first uh, sermon that was ever preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. He preached boldly, the Bible says, and 3,000 people came to the faith. Those 3,000 people were Jews who were in Jerusalem for the Passover, and they were from all over the world, the known world at that time, but they were Jews. So the church, the early church, was literally 100% Jewish, all right? And so Jesus wasn't a big deal for them. Jesus was just a, a continuation of what they already believed. Jesus was just an extension of who they were. Because you see, all of them had been told by all the prophets that a Messiah was coming. Probably the most in-your-face prophet of all was Isaiah. He said exactly what was going to happen. So these people who were hearing about Jesus were putting two and two together. Well, that's what Isaiah said. And they're like, yeah, we get it. We get it. Okay, he's the Messiah. He's our Messiah. He's Jewish. We're Jewish. All is right with the world. I mean, Jesus is just an extension of what they already believed. They already believed, you know, the past was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and now Jesus. All's right with the world until us Gentiles got involved. And that changed everything. Now it's 10 or 15 years later. You heard, you remember Apollo 13, Houston, we got a problem? Well, Paul is screaming, Jerusalem, we got a problem. And it started in a place called Antioch. These Gentiles, these non-Jewish people are going, Jesus is the Messiah. We get it too. We're going to follow him. That caused a lot of problems. Because you see, now Jesus is not the Messiah or our Messiah. Jesus is their Messiah. And that changes everything. But you never thought about that before. And it all changed because Paul did what the church told him to do. Go share the gospel with the non-Jewish Gentile people, which is what he did. And guess what? Holy Spirit moved among them people, and they started saying, yeah, Jesus is the one. Well, wait a minute. What was the church expecting them to do? Become Jewish? That just caused a whole lot of problems. I mean, it's kind of not like our church, because our church isn't that way. Thrive's not that way. But, you know, it's kind of like some other churches. When somebody who's not part of their church comes into their church for the first time, and maybe they're a little different, they don't dress the same way, they don't smell the same way, they don't look the same way, they don't act the same way. And what does the church do? Not a rhetorical question. What does the church, what's the church do? Usually they block them, they shut them out, they, they ignore them, whatever it takes to get rid of them, right? And I honor you guys, you don't do that. You don't do that. It doesn't matter who walks through the doors of this church, 
you welcome them warmly, and I honor you for that. But not a lot of churches do that. And that was what was going to happen here now. People who didn't look like them, who didn't smell like them, who didn't act like them, were now coming into the church. We got a problem. We got to fix this, okay? So that kind of gets you up to speed. How can a non-Jewish person follow a Jewish Messiah without becoming Jewish? That was the question. That was the question. You see, when the Gentiles came to know Jesus, they didn't leave their old habits there. They didn't leave their old customs there. They knew nothing about what it meant to be ceremoniously clean before you go into the temple. They didn't understand that. They didn't know you couldn't eat North Carolina barbecue. They didn't know that. I mean, they, they hung out there and smoked some meat and ate it. They didn't know. Of course, that totally offended the Jews, okay? And the fact that they didn't clean themselves up ceremoniously before they went to church, that offended them too. So now you see there's this big problem. There's this big problem that if you want to blame it on somebody, let's blame it on Paul, okay? He's the one that went and talked to him. He's the one that shared the gospel. Paul's the one that created this firestorm. Now, it's obvious to the Jewish believers that these non-Jews, they just needed to learn how to be Jew. That was it. Like, just teach them how to be Jewish. That's all we got to do. We got to teach them the law. We got to teach them the ceremonies. We got to teach them the customs. Life is going to be good. And that doesn't sound like a bad idea. I mean, when people come in here and they accept Jesus, our role is to grow them up in the faith, to teach them what, what's right and what's wrong and those kinds of things. So saying that don't sound bad till you stop and think about what it really means. Now, ladies, I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but the Gentile men needed to get circumcised. I got to believe that puts a screech and halt on everything, you know? I mean, you, you're, you're following Jesus now. Cool. Now we're going to circumcise you. Wait, wait, what? You're going to do what to me? Can you imagine that would be something that would really draw a lot of men into the faith at that time? I mean, think about it. I'm being honest with you, right? So that created a major problem in the church. That created a major, major problem in the church. So that's how we end up with the council of Jerusalem. So if you got your outlines, got a lot I want to cover, but I'm going to cover it really quickly. Get your outlines out. Let's talk about this. This council of people, the first thing they had to decide was number one, how do you become a follower of Jesus? That sounds so simple today, but it was not a simple question to answer back then. How do you become a follower of Jesus? That's something that this council of Jerusalem literally struggled with. They argued about it. They debated it. And we, it starts in Acts chapter 15. Here's how it all came about. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch in Syria, some men from Judah arrived and began teaching the believers. These are non-Jewish believers. Unless you are circumcised, According to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Wow. I would say this is a big deal for the Gentile men. Okay? Yeah, you're different from us, but you got to do what we say do or you can't be one of us. You know what? It's not unlike what something that's going on today. In fact, if you look, look, on, the, look on the internet and, and search this out, in Lebanon today, there's a lot of Muslims who are coming to the faith in Jesus. There's a lot of Muslim men and women who are accepting Jesus as their Savior. And there's a lot of confusion about what they can and can't do now that they're followers of Jesus. For example, a question that they debate all the time is whether or not a woman can take her headgear off. Or does she still have to wear a burqa or a sherpa, the other things that they have to wear? Can she, does she still have to wear that or not? And to this, that sounds like, just take it off. Well, it's not that easy when that's what you've known all your life. 
And then the other issue is a lot of the Muslim men who are coming to the faith are bringing their three, four, five, six, eight wives with them. Can they do that? So today, I mean, the same kinds of questions are going on in the church. What can people do who come to the faith who are not like us, who have different customs than we do? How do they have to act in order to follow Jesus? So the question is just as real today as it was 2,000 years ago. What do they need to do? And these are very important questions that Paul and Barnabas, both Jewish, had strong opinions about that wasn't the same as everybody else. Look at Acts chapter 15. I'm giving you verses 2, and then I'm going to skip to 4 and 5. And from the Living Bible, it says, Paul and Barnabas argued and discussed this with them at length. And finally, the believers sent them to Jerusalem, accompanied by some of the local men, to talk to the apostles and elders there about this question. Arriving in Jerusalem, they met with the church leaders. All of the apostles and elders were present. And Paul and Barnabas reported on what God had been doing through their ministry. But then some of the men who had been Pharisees before their conversion, just like Paul was, stood to their feet and declared that all Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow all the Jewish customs and ceremonies. This could be really bad. I mean, it could certainly cause a lot of people to think twice before saying they want to follow Jesus. This is not something that's going to fill the churches. This is not something that's going to multiply believers if this is what they got to do. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Does it mean that if you're not Jewish, you got to do this stuff that man says you have to do before you can follow Jesus? Is it a chance that you can do some stuff that will give you more favor with God? Well, we know the answer to that already. I have told you God will never love you any more than he loves you right this second. He'll never love you any less either. So there's absolutely nothing you can do to cause him to like you more, okay? So, but this was a question. We know that they, they, they struggle with this. And then we see Peter stand up. Peter, you know, the guy that was scared to death until he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he boldly preached. Peter stands up in front of this council and he probably makes one of the most important addresses in all of church history. Certainly what he said affects you and me today, 2,000 years later. Look at what he said, Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 7. Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, y'all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirms that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening these Gentile believers with the yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. He says the issue is about grace, guys. It ain't about doing stuff. It's about grace. And what is grace? unmerited favor grace means you get something you didn't deserve grace means you get something you didn't earn grace means you got something you didn't work for it was given to you freely and he said that's what God has done through the grace of God we're saved through faith in Jesus we're never going to get there by doing something. We're never going to get there by following a custom. We're never going to get there by following man's law. We're only going to get there through the grace of God, through faith in Jesus. That's the way you make God 
happy. He said, why ask him to do something that we failed at doing? Why ask them to accomplish something we can't do? That's a great question. But you understand today it seems so simple to understand what the real answer is. But they struggled with this. They debated this. They argued about this. Things were changing. And quite honestly, they didn't like the way it was changing. I hear people say all the time, people who are hardcore in in what we would call the traditional church, that a church like Thrive is different and wrong. I mean, the preacher don't even button his shirt. And he wears tennis shoes. And he probably waters down the gospel too. You know what? God don't care what I wear when I talk to y'all. As long as I'm decent. He could care less if I got on red tennis shoes or purple tennis shoes. What God cares about is that I share the gospel of Jesus with you. And what God cares about is that you don't believe a word I say. You go find it out for yourself. What God cares about is summed up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Understand something. It ain't about stuff you do. It sounds so simple today. But also understand where they were. And it sounded like they were throwing away everything they'd ever believed. So they struggled. They struggled hard. And so when Peter got up and said this stuff, he said, guys, we can't do it. We're kidding ourselves. We can't do it. Why are we going to ask them to do it? It's about grace. It's about grace. And that brings me to the second point. I didn't know how to write this one, so it may not make sense to you. It made sense in my simple little brain when I wrote it. Here it is. James saved the day and us. Right in the middle of this debate, right in the middle of this heated argument about what the church is going to do, James stood up. Who's James? The best way to describe James is he's Jesus' half-brother. His mama and daddy was Mary and Joseph, okay? He was the younger brother. And he had to live with the fact that his older brother went around telling everybody he was the Messiah. He didn't believe Jesus. We kind of give him grief for that a little bit. But, I mean, it's kind of like... If you had a brother and he said he was the savior of the world. How would you act? I mean, literally all through Jesus's ministry, James didn't believe him. James thought he was crazy. James was embarrassed by him. On more than one occasion, he said, he's just my older brother stupid brother in fact the bible says he didn't believe until he saw with his own two eyes jesus risen from the grave and then he went whoa he must be right so he 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 came to believe but not until he saw okay just like you and me i don't know what it's like to have a brother or sister god just Bless me that way. But I can imagine what you would think if your brother stood up and said that. You'd think he's crazy, right? So that's what James did. So when James stood up in the middle of this debate, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And it was probably hard for him. But he knows what he saw. And he saw Jesus risen. And that's all that matters. So look at what he says, starting in the 13th verse of chapter 15. 
when they had finished, James stood up and said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take them from a people for himself. And it's this conversion of the Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, now he's quoting the prophets. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. That was quoted right from the prophet, okay? So then after that, he says this. And so my judgment is, in other words, Listen, guys, here's what I think. That's what he said. James says, my judgment is we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. He stepped into the debate with both feet. Okay? He stepped into it with probably some of the most profound wisdom. And it affected you and me and the way we act today in church. At stake was not only this whole issue of circumstance, of, of circumcision, which is enough to keep me away from it, okay? But also at stake was the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses. Also at stake was the 613 laws that the Jews gave themselves, which no one could follow. All that stuff was at stake. It was all there. Later, later, I don't know how much later, but a, a, a while later, when Paul wrote his letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesus, he addressed this very thing. Now, we read this scripture all the time from Ephesus, and we don't, we don't connect the dots. But he's talking about what happened at the Council of Jerusalem in Ephesus chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. He says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can tie that right back to the council at Jerusalem in this discussion. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see, this is the whole idea is grace. The whole idea is grace. This idea of unmerited favor that's freely given from God. This goes all the way back, and you've heard me talk about it many times, the plan of reconciliation that God came up with before creation, before he created anything, he realized there had to be a way back to God for fallen man. He knew he had to figure that out. And his way back was through Jesus. The only way that a sinful man can be reconnected with a holy God. He had it figured out. And he gave it to us. It's free. It's grace. We don't have to stand on our heads. We don't have to face a certain direction when we pray. And we don't have to be circumcised if we don't want to. Praise God. Salvation is only possible because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Regardless of who we are, regardless of what we've done, regardless of what we look like, regardless of our race, regardless of our gender, regardless of our ethnicity, no matter what, it doesn't matter. We have access to God's grace and his mercy, period. Now, you've heard me, you've heard preachers say that as long as you've been in church. Have you ever really wrapped your brain around? Have you ever really stopped to think about what that means? If you do, it'll change everything. It really means what you hear me say almost every Sunday morning. God did all the heavy lifting. So we wouldn't have to. But you understand if the council of Jerusalem 
had not bought into what James and Peter and Paul were saying, we would look totally different today. What we do in church would be totally different. We actually would be no more than kind of an offshoot of Judaism, a little sect of our own. But as a result of them agreeing together that grace is the answer through faith, that's why we look the way we look today. That's why we're able to do what we do in church today. Because of that council in Jerusalem. Because they decided, okay, this is what it means when somebody who is not Jewish accepts Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm glad they were smart enough to figure that out. I'm glad James realized that. I'm glad Peter realized that. And it's all amazing to me that the God of heaven and earth loves me that much. That is so cool. It's also amazing when you stop and think about they hadn't figured that out in the early church. They still figured it. it you had to do a bunch of stuff. It was a works-based salvation is what they thought. Although they didn't say that. And that brings me to the third point. Because you see, when we accept God's grace and we accept the, the, the saving, amazing, saving thing, I can't think of another word, that Jesus did on that cross, it brings us to the third point. And that's this. We've been set completely free. This is amazing. And there's a little verse in the Bible that sums it all up in one sentence. And a lot of times we as believers, we blow right past that sentence. And it's this. John chapter 8 verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. I didn't even get an amen to that. I'm going to say the verse again. Okay. So if the sun sets you free. You are truly free. See. Jesus came that we might be free. And here's the deal. From the inside out. And that's important. See he came so that we would no longer be bound from the outside in. And what I mean by that, that we have to do things like wash or cleanse ourselves ceremoniously. We have to follow rituals and customs. We're no longer bound from the outside in by those 613 laws that are in the Jewish faith. But we are completely free by Holy Spirit. And that's something to shout about. That is something to shout about. Now, this week when I was going through this, I was looking just at different translations of a verse. And I found one I've fallen in love with. And it's not a familiar translation. It is a not well-known translation. It's on, the, it's on Bible Gateway's website. It's called the Passion Translation. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it or not. But here's what Acts 15, 19 says in the Passion Translation. So in my judgment, we should not add any unnecessary burden upon the non-Jewish converts who are turning to God. In the, New, in the New Living, it's so is my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, here's the deal. Don't make it religious. Don't make it religious. Don't make it hard to understand. Don't make it so that the only people who know what's going on are the clergy. That's a setup for failure. Okay? Because if that's what you do, I could stand up here and tell you anything and you'd buy it. Again, that's why I always say, don't believe what I say. You go home and look it up for yourself. It's not hard. They didn't make it hard. They didn't make it difficult. They made it real and they made it clear. Folks need to understand that to be a follower of Jesus simply means you have a relationship with him, a personal relationship. You see, God's truth 
should free us. It shouldn't bind us. God's truth should fill us. It shouldn't throttle us down or whip us into submission. That's not who God is. His truth doesn't need to be full of it. I, I couldn't think of a better word, so I made up one. But I think when I say it, you'll get what I'm saying. God's truth should not be full of Christianese. You know what I mean? You know it when you see it, right? Christianese stuff. It shouldn't be made up of a bunch of church lingo. It shouldn't be. It should be just plain and simple truth. That's all it should be. That's all it should be. And here it is wrapped up for you, okay, with a bow on it. The God of heaven and earth is crazy about you. That's the truth. He is crazy about you. He said you are his masterpiece. He said you give him joy. He said he loves you. That's simple truth. The question comes down to what are you going to do with the truth? Once you hear the truth, you have to make a decision. Do you believe it or not? Do you buy into it or not? It ain't hard. It's real simple. It's so simple that a child could understand it. Which gives me another opportunity to say in two weeks we're opening up Kids Thrive. And there are going to be people in that rooms, in those rooms in there, that are going to be sharing that simple truth with your kids. And they're old enough to understand it. Because God puts a God-shaped void in all of us. All of us. Jesus said if you had the faith of a child, you could do miraculous things. That's why you've heard me say thousands of times, and I'm not the only one you've ever heard say this. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. We should be focused on making sure, first and foremost, that our relationship with Jesus is where it should be. And I look around this room, and I think for the most part, it probably is. But the question is, what kind of relationship do you have? Do you really spend time talking to him in prayer? Do you really spend time listening to him through his word? Do you really spend time thinking about what he cares about? Seth earlier today was talking about how we act when we're in love and how we sing sometimes in our car and don't care how stupid we look. You ever do that for Jesus? You ever feel that way for him? You ever go down the road just singing crazy, stupid worship songs and not care about what the person next to you is thinking even though they're staring at you? Here's something else. Once we figure out our relationship, here's the deal. Really hit me this week. A lot of you on your connection cards always ask me to pray for somebody. Your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your next door neighbor, people's names, I ain't got a clue who they are. But they mean something to you. God has put them in your life for a reason. My question is, is all you're doing is praying for them? Do they know Jesus? Are you going through life just praying that somebody else will tell them about Jesus? God put them in your life for a reason. And here's the deal. If you, because you're scared to, if you because you don't know what they'll think of you, if you because you like them and you want them to continue to like you, decide to keep your mouth shut about Jesus, one day they're going to take their last breath on this planet just like you. And if they take that last breath without knowing Jesus, their eternity is sealed. They will spend eternity in a place called hell that wasn't made for them and they will be separated from God. Do you want that to happen? Maybe you're the one that plants the seed. 
Maybe you're the one that's going to water. Maybe you're the one that's going to reap the harvest. Maybe you're the one that's going to keep your mouth shut and say nothing. It's just a simple relationship. But it is the most important relationship they will ever have as you will ever have. My prayer this morning is that God will give you the courage through Holy Spirit to do more than pray for them. To actually say something. Change their world. You know, somebody prayed for you. But somebody had the courage to actually say something to you. God put them in your life for a reason. The council of Jerusalem happened for a reason. And here we are. God loves them as much as he loves you. But they have free will just like you did. Help them make the right choice. Speak up. Let's pray. Father, you're an amazing God and we thank you. We love you. I thank you. I thank you for this council, this group of people that got together and really, really sorted it out what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and I thank you that they were wise enough and smart enough to realize it is your grace it is your grace and through faith in Jesus that seals our eternity with you father my prayer this morning is for everyone in this room who already has that relationship Father, my prayer for them is that they will be encouraged and empowered through Holy Spirit to share you with the people you've placed in their life. And I thank you. I thank you for what you're going to do in them and through them to help those people find the Jesus, the real Jesus of the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.